this meeting to order. Um, there will be no uh, agenda adjustments tonight, and this meeting is being audio taped. Now I'll ask for a motion to approve the sets of minutes that are listed. So moved. Situate that. Second, Second by Whitman. Oh, Situate and Whitman. Any discussion on those minutes? Nope. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It is motion carries it's unanimous. Uh, reports. We'll go right to Jim, the treasurer, please. Thank you, Bob. Um, in your package, you have the treasurer's report for November 30th. Um, on the cover page, I know Dan sent an email earlier today um, claiming that Whitman hasn't received any um, paperwork yet, but, but the front cover has a listing of everybody that was billed um, through the end, all of our costs through the end of September for the CARES Act. Um, so all of our member towns obviously have a larger amount than our non-member towns. It's, it goes by enrollment. Um, it's been allocated out. Janine's been a, done a great job of keeping track of, of everything. Of course, we've spent a lot more than the $89,000 that's on the bottom of the column, but we've only paid for $89,000 so far. So a lot of the items are, are in the process of being ordered. And again, this is only through September 30th. Um, we'll be, she's processing now a, another list of expenses through November 30th. So we'll have October, November expenses accumulated and we'll be sending them out um, within a week or so to, to the member towns because again, right. everybody wants to get things done by the, um, by the again, this, this money is good through the end of December. Um, so we'll, we'll get our, those invoices out for all of our other costs. So, and Susan did, again, Dan, since Susan did send over a um, email today that and I have the new guy at Whitman that I'll forward everything to as well. Gina has been out a couple days um, for quarantine issues, but um, you know, we'll get, she's working remotely, so we'll be able to get those things over to the Whitman person. So, um, All right, so thank, far, you. thank you, Jim. Thank and you. in the middle column, this is through, through last week, we have received $17,000 of, of payments from member towns. Um, so again, it's, it's on the right track. And again, once we send it to them, they then have to include it in their warrants and then package it together and then send it to Plymouth County. So we understand there's going to be a lag and a, just in a delay. Um, we did submit a lot of information as well to FEMA. Um, and through the listserv with all the other business managers throughout the state that have done um, FEMA type of um, reimbursements, uh, FEMA is denying everything and they're making people jump through hoops to justify every cost and so forth. And we got a, we got a, um, um, a notice as well looking for a substantiation of when, when particular items were actually used and it's just a, um, it's a headache. And again, we can only dip into the, into the waters once. So if we got FEMA money, we would have to reduce our, our money to reimbursements that we're requesting from Plymouth County and the other towns wow. because it is the same amount of money. So it's sort of a, we're only gonna get paid once. And right now Plymouth County seems to be the, the better item. And we have done our due diligence to, to, do, to, to send the expenses to FEMA. But again, it's, it's been a nightmare dealing with them. Again, that's, that's not just us, it's across the state as well. So, um, so that's the cover page. Uh, second page is the again statement of financial position. Um, you know, November thirtieth. Anybody has any questions? Again, just just pop in. Um, again, our cash balances at the end of uh, November were six point three million. Overall, things are well. Um, you'll notice that um, I've I've dipped into another community bank um, at the at the middle of the page, Coastal Heritage, which is a um, a situate based bank. Um, we've we've moved some money into that into that bank as well. We've Again, we've hit all the community banks that we've, um, you know, for, for our towns and so forth. So we've been able to, um, you know, again, spread the wealth um, with everybody. So everything's, everything's going well. And at the bottom, we have our OPEB reserve, which is at $770,000. So again, those are our cash balances. Next page is our revenues for um, through November. Again, we did the, we did the billing for um, the towns. Um, and again, we, we did receive all of our, expected amounts for um, November, which is a little over $2 million of our, our assessments. Um, down below, there are a couple items that, that, that we, um, we get our 370,000 from the state on our chapter 70, which is like, again, like clockwork. There's a couple items which are the non-resident tuition and the surplus revenue of our, our regional transportation numbers. Those are monies that are, that are encumbered back in June and then apply to the um, fiscal 21. And this is, this is the month that 
we got around to, to doing the journal entries to make them, to put them into um, um, fiscal 21. So that's why they appear there for additional revenue. So overall we're doing, we're doing well um, cash flow wise and, and with all the, the money that's come in. At the bottom, we have the out of district tuition of what we've billed everybody. Um, and then through the um, end of November, we have received money from Marshfield and Hull. And we, we have had, I believe um, a bunch of other towns have paid since the, um, the 1st of December. So again, the money keeps rolling in on that side. So things are going well. Um, and the final page is the, the um, or the final part of this report is the um, expenditures. Again, um, payroll is $680,000, which is, you know, two thirds of what we, what we have. Everything else, again, it's like clockwork. There's not a lot of changes from, from time to time. Um, again, the utility bills are, are, you know, very reasonable at this point. Again, these, the situate solar deal is still running strong and, and doing a very good job for us. Um, and everything else looks to be and not, not anything totally out of whack. Um, there is one line item on, on line 25, books and instructions. Um, that's, that we, I think we'll have a budget transfer for that um, later on. But what ended up happening was that we had to buy additional licenses from Ingenuity, I believe it was, um, for some of the remote learning. And, and that was, I, I don't think that was an expected expense at the first of the year. So that's, that's part of the, um, the books and instructions that kick in for this this month, but overall 991,000 of expenses. So again, everything's, everything's looking good. So, um, and that's it for the treasury report. Any questions? I have a question to for you, uh, Jim. That, that, that uh, line item 25, where you said because of the COVA, is there any reimbursement we can get due to that? Every, everything related to COVA is, being is gonna be submitted for reimbursement. Okay. Um, I mean, and, and again, a lot, every town is different. Um, if, I mean, on the front page, we requested $148 from, from Kingston for one student. And the town accountant down there sent us a list of 14 things, um, wondering why, you know, to tell us what the use of these, these 14 items were. And again, Janine did a great job answering all the questions and I realized it was for $148, but um, a little bit, a lot of work to, to collect $148. But again, it's, I know it. It, it is the mindset and it's, again, everybody's just doing their due diligence before she submits that to Plymouth County. She wants to make sure all of her ducks in are in a row. Um, there's some towns that have come back with questions. Again, just yeah. clarifying the use of, hey, what is this thing that pops up on your list? What was that used for? And that'll help us as we do this, the, the next round, we will probably, we'll have Janine and, and put a, add a column to the, to the spreadsheet, just to specifically identifying any of the, the items that might be questioned to save the questions down the road. But again, people like um, the, the towns that have sent us money, uh, Abington sent us 12,000, Situate sent us you know, close to 4,000. I mean, we got the money without any questions from any of their right. people over there. So everything's going well. Um, okay. And again, we will we'll, we'll be sending another round out in, in probably a week or so. And then once the closing of the books you know, through December, we'll wrap everything up and, and um, send another final billing off to the, to the towns. And then as Tom mentioned in previous months, we do have a grant from the state and the grant from the state actually will, will cover expenditures through June 30th. So a lot of that money really hasn't been touched yet. We're waiting for that money. We'll cover some of our post January 1st expenses. So we'll be able to um, use that somewhere down the road. So. Um, yeah, because the, the monies that we, we sent to you, we sent to Plymouth County and hopefully they approve and we get reimbursed. As each Correct. town goes for COVID nineteen issues. No, I know. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Motion. I'll, uh, second. I'll second that, Whitman. Oh, Any discussion on the motion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion carries. Budget transfers, Jim. Yeah, we have one twin budget transfer, which is for the books and instructions, again, for $35,000. And again, because of the, a lot of the expenses that are, that are COVID related, they've, they've um, exceeded the budgeted amount and just the budget will come out of the, the money will come out of the electricity account. Again, we have a favorable balance and a projected favorable balance based upon the situate um, fields, so. Okay. Right. Hanson will make the motion. Second. Uh, what, okay. Go ahead. Hanson motion, second by Whitman. Okay. I guess. Any, any discussion? 
No, I just have one question for Jim, please. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, Jim, it just has nothing to do with any of the reports, just that they're, we're coming up the end of the year with the lunch and breakfast program. Is that going to yeah. be a, a budget thing that we're going to have to, to work on for the coming up, or are we going to be able to extend that after the first of the year? I believe it's going to happen. I think Tom can jump in, but I think it was extended throughout the, the, the entire school year. Yes, uh, all, all students have access to, uh, to free breakfast and lunch. Yeah, through, okay. I know it was to, to the end of the year first, right? And then, that's uh, that's correct. The Department of uh, USDA first get put a put a shelf life on it, and then they did extend it. So that's good news. Question. All right. Thank you. Okay. Back to the budget transfers. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Seeing none. Motion carries. The chairman tonight has nothing except to wish everyone a merry Christmas. So subcommittees, there are no subcommittee reports tonight. And uh, now I'll recognize the superintendent, Tom, for his report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, hello. I believe you. Oh, hello. hello. Yes. OK, I believe you all have a hard copy of the uh, budget presentation. I'll, uh, I'm going to share my screen here so that if you if this is easier. So uh, as you've seen in years past, I'd, I'd open up the presentation here showing that our school mission statement really drives all that we're doing, whether we're in a tough economic time or more robust time, uh, this mission guides our priorities. And you've been a big part of making sure that we stay true to that mission. I also like to start in the beginning of the presentation by celebrating our accomplishments. And normally I would have a long bulleted list except I can, I can uh, summarize it here in an obvious way that from March 13th of last, uh, you know, gone by almost a year now, we have been relearning so much about teaching and learning in a pandemic. I couldn't be, I couldn't be happier with the efforts that our kids and our families and our staff are making. So that is certainly one day at a time, we feel a sense of accomplishment as we're trying to do what's best for students. But we do look to the future when we will uh, be on the other side of this public health crisis. And in terms of setting goals, we will get back to what we were prioritizing prior to our uh, prior to COVID. We'll still be focusing on subgroups of students who need to uh, score proficient on MCAS. We want to reconnect and reestablish a community, an in-person community, 100% of the time. Uh, We'll have children in our building from new ninth graders to next year's juniors who will all have uh, had some, you know, complete year in a, in a, in a, a high, a year of high school, I should say, that, that was an impacted by COVID. There'll be skills gaps, there'll be social emotional uh, deficits, and uh, it'll give us an opportunity to reculture our building and work together. In facilities, we spend a lot of time talking about how we want to target master facilities plan priorities and how you've heard me say, and I will mention later, about the need to uh, position ourselves for a debt authorization while at the same time submitting statements of interest to MSBA. And once again, we will be looking to make sure that students avail themselves of our breakfast program and continue to make attendance a priority. Those are our goals going forward. Those of you within our community, you know well enough that zero-based budgeting is, is a cornerstone of how we are able to uh, be flexible and targeted with our dollars. Our process, despite COVID, has run approximately the same, giving our department heads and cost center supervisors a little extra time starting off the year. We still bring ourselves to this December meeting, or I can tell you that the department heads did a wonderful job in prioritizing and knowing that this was overall a lean year uh, that we would expect uh, on the state level and also at the local level as dollars are spread through educational and non-educational departments in each of our towns. 
We have always done a great job controlling for costs through long range planning, through grants, industry donations, and of course the use of our, the use of our in-house talent. One second here. So let me give you an overarching view of the proposal. I'll, I'll focus a lot on the next slide, which are the headliners. And then I'll get into slides that many of you have seen before regarding our capital needs, uh, a master facilities plan uh, highlight sheet, uh, a little bit on the MSBA. Again, this is five to six years now that we've been talking about the same priorities, but they deserve to be mentioned for the benefit of our communities. And when we go to finance committees and advisory committees, we would certainly be highlighting this. And then we'll talk about enrollment and assessment information, and then some timelines on town meetings later on in the spring. So the budget proposal for fiscal 22 is 1.89%. And my proposal takes into account uh, some important time spent on looking at revenue projections. I anticipate that in this upcoming budget cycle that we will have, uh, we'll, we'll see an increase in our chapter 70 because we've had a, we had a significant swing of in-district students, but at the same time, a reduction in non-resident students. So in years past, I might've said to you that, you know, our revenue will be level funded. We can expect the same number of dollars to come from chapter 70 and non-resident tuition and regional transportation. And so we can count on that. I'm anticipating that the revenue will be slightly lower. Uh, it could be anywhere from 100 to $150,000 lower. So in order to project a following year's budget, we have to account for a potential revenue shortfall and then look at new dollars. And so in this year, uh, we're able to, we're, we are certainly able to keep things moving forward, but uh, it certainly is a, a smaller percentage increase than in years past. Uh, I do anticipate, not at this meeting tonight, and, and but between now and the time we will certify a budget in February uh, to talk further about revenue in the form of money coming from our stabilization fund. This budget really focuses on running the schoolhouse, meeting our educational needs operationally, but having enough money set aside to prioritize one final significant capital project before we move into uh, the need for the debt authorization to tackle larger projects. So, there will be more money talk regarding uh, stabilization at, the, at our January and our February meetings as we can refine our projections a little bit better. In terms of education, students and inside the school in the areas of curriculum supplies and technology, I think the two biggest priorities for next year are our maintenance of a one-to-one -one device situation. The pandemic forced us to move into an area that we may not have done in, in the way that we did, but now this is the new normal and every student has their own device and I would see it as a priority to keep that and to keep our students with devices in the way that we're doing that right now. So that this budget will allow for that initiative to be maintained. And we'll have a replacement of uh, history texts, which is something that is done every six or seven years and this just happens to be the cycle uh, where that is embedded in this, uh, in this budget. The capital project I'll talk about later, you're well aware of it, is looking at our next priorities of a window panel replacement in the 1992 edition and also a roof replacement. This fiscal 22 budget proposal has no debt. Uh, technically, we had about $4,500 in interest uh, that we were carrying in fiscal 21. But when we break down town assessment numbers uh, after the governor's budget comes out, there will be no debt service for fiscal 22. It would be in fiscal 23 that we would see potentially uh, that number adjusted once we talk further about debt authorization and the priorities that the committee sets for uh, allocating funds. But for now, that's, the, that's, that's essentially uh, the debt category for fiscal 22, which, is, which would be zero. In the area of personnel, there are some small strategic adjustments. This is the second year in a row that I'm looking to move a portion of our English learner instructor position uh, off of the Title I grant onto our budget, uh, moving the horticulture aid from the Perkins grant onto the budget, and also to provide some part-time nurse support, which I'm defining as LPN support for our allied health program to assist with clinicals, uh, clinical off-campus experiences, 
and potentially to also continue to support our school nurse. So those are three areas that, uh, while it's not while it's not a massive infusion of dollars, these are these are three key areas that that this budget can support. And as always, it's not a headliner for those of us that have heard this year in and year out, but it is important to note that it, around 16% of this district's entire budget includes costs that are not normally found in a in a K to 12 budget. The, the costs exist, but we are responsible for maintaining all of the costs uh, on our on our ledger: insurances, retirement, taxes, uh, debt, uh, OPEB, uh, unemployment are some examples of those costs. So I'll unpack a few of the headliners here. Tom, I have a question on one, one item you just yeah, let's, spoke yeah, and, and thank you, Bob. And, and feel free, please please feel free to jump in if it's more timely to do so. Go right ahead. Um, for the history book update, as long as it doesn't cut out some of the historic past history, uh, there's a tendency that politicians and so forth want to uh, cut out some of our earlier history because of oh, political jargon and uh, the uh, change in philosophies of uh, yes. uh, what happened in our history. Yeah, I would say there's, I, I, I don't have any concerns with that at all, Bob. Uh, as, as, the, as the curriculum frame, we're, you know, we're, we're obligated to, uh, to to design courses around curriculum frameworks, and uh, U.S. history is uh, is is an essential part of our freshman curriculum, and so we don't we don't see any changes, and we don't see any massive changes with the with the resources that our department uh, members have been vetting. So, th uh, thank you for that point, and I, I have no concerns in that area. Tom, I have a question, if I may. Yeah. Yes, when you take certain things off of certain grants and yep. put them into the budget. Do you have other uses for those grants? Yes, absolutely. Part of the strategy for me, Dan, is not always knowing what the federal, the federal grant numbers for the following year don't come out until much later. So right. I do, uh, in, in my reading and, and in conversation with, uh, you know, people that are, that, are, that are looking at grants, I do get concerned that if I have a person entirely on a grant and there's a chance that that grant could be level funded or perhaps reduced, then it's if it's if it's a position that we're going to keep for a very long time, it's it's a right. good I agree. To, to begin to incrementally move it. Uh, with regard to the special education or Title I grants, it's a combination of personnel, technology, professional development, and supplies. And the Perkins grant is our vocational technical grant, which we have used uh, I think quite well over the years. Some years it's had we've had a couple of years of personnel, and then we move them onto the budget. And then in other years, it's been almost entirely equipment. What's good about, good. again, because of our long range planning, I don't feel a sense of crisis that our technical programs are going to be starved of equipment because we're planning it out. And I can tell you when that, that uh, you know, this vehicle needs to be replaced or this, or this lathe needs to be replaced, people are, are doing a very good job. So I can also use the Perkins grant to support the over, you know, to making sure that we keep our technology current. So the short, the short answer, Dan, is yes. There's a, there's, a, there's a supply, equipment, or personnel need. Okay. With personnel, if you're going to put personnel on a grant, you, you probably have to. If you're only going to put the person on for just one year, maybe it's because you have other opportunities. But equipment, the great news about equipment is it can be purchased once, you have it, and then you can look at other priorities. Right. Good. Thank you. So yeah, no problem. All right, thank you for those questions. Uh, the, the next slide dealing with capital unpacks what a little bit of what I said earlier. So we're, so we're working with our capital project subcommittee uh, to take a, and, and over the next six months, they're gonna be spending some time taking a look and, uh, and working with our project manager on our two identified priority projects, the replacement of windows in our 1992 edition and also the roof. You've heard me say going back several months and forecasting even from, from last fiscal year that we're reaching the end of the master facilities projects that we can reasonably embed in one budget year. So I'm very sensitive to not wanting to see a one-year spike in assessments, but I also need the school to be in as tip-top shape as we all want it. So the strategy here is that 
it's probably going to cost about $760,000 to replace the windows and the panels under the windows. This was identified in 2018 when we did the plan. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm learning is that uh, for somewhat COVID related reasons, we've got a backlog industry wide of, of window orders. And so it may be, and, and that's why I'm, I'm not looking to nail it down right now, but I'm looking to set aside within this budget enough money that if the windows could be done first, we would do the windows and we would fund it in, in, through the capital line. If, if it turned out that a, a roof replacement could actually be done in fiscal 22, then I would be talking to you a little bit later this winter about prioritizing the roof. And then the roof, the roof replacement will, would be a little more than what's here, but that's where stabilization would come in to, to support. Or if for some reason we decided that we should push both projects to the very end of 22 and the beginning of 23, we can strategize how a debt authorization could work into that. But if we went with priority one, if we had control over window delivery, we would do the windows first in this budget. That's what the plan shows here. At the same time, also on this slide, there's a small, uh, the relatively small uh, estimated cost for us to expand some parking. We've got, I think, one more, we might have one more uh, option after this, but I'm very pleased that we have a plan that's already been approved to add 24 spots right near our entrance across from our restaurant and our salon, which will serve us well on a daily basis. So we can continue to be there for the community when things get back to normal, we can continue to host civic events and we can have more flexibility about vehicles on campus. That's what the parking space expansion item refers to. And the third item on design funds is essentially a sum of money that will allow us to continue to look beyond the next round of construction. So what I mean by that is right now in fiscal 21, we are working on the design for the windows and the roof. We're designing it in fiscal 21 and we'll have those designs ready to bid and then figure out which order we would undertake them in construction in fiscal 22. But while fiscal 22 is going on, we also need to be looking more closely at the next round of design for other priorities. And so there's additional capital money here that will allow us to determine what those priorities are. And I've listed a few, again, this is, this is nothing that's recent, uh, that you know, ventilation, fire suppression and other projects so that we can keep making progress, designing in one fiscal year, procuring and constructing in the other. So the biggest, I, I, this is really the, the, the biggest part of this overall budget, these funds being included for capital purposes. Okay, I will move on. Uh, the next slide in the presentation is an attempt to just create a, a, a visual, maybe more concise summary. That, and I won't read you all, I won't read these slides, but you can see that there's a logical flow for the window or roof project, design, procure, and then plan the construction. And as I said, maybe we can do one project this summer and the other one in the following summer. But we'll come back to you, the full committee, with some more refined recommendations in the very near future. And then on the other column, I mentioned the debt authorization here. I mentioned it briefly a little earlier. For us to be able to have access to funding down the road for fiscal 23 and beyond, uh, the debt authorization process starts with this committee talking about what our priorities are. Unfortunately, we've done a lot of work in that area. And then by the spring of 2021, I would be asking you to take a vote to to authorize debt, which under the law starts a 60 day process. You authorize debt for a certain sum of money for specific purposes. This would be spelled out in a warrant article. Within seven days of a springtime vote, this would then be sent to our eight towns and they would have 60 days to address the matter if they chose to at a town meeting. If they took no action, it would be considered a yes. If they brought it to town meeting, it would be subject to a town meeting vote. This is exactly the process that, that, that this committee followed in, um, in, 20, in 2010 for the roof project and the window project that we did on the 1962 building. So debt authorization, I'm gonna ask the chairman that we just keep this on our agenda uh, for January, for February, for March. I'll bring you some language. We can talk more about the priorities involved so that when we do talk to our finance committees, 
We've, I've made our town administrators aware, but when we are starting our finance committee conversations, my intention would be to talk about this presentation, but also I want them to hear clearly what it is that we're looking for. And for any finance committee members who have been on their respective committees for a few years, it would not come as a surprise what this committee wants to do to maintain and modernize and expand our building. So a couple of timelines that we're paying attention to as we go forward in this process. The next several slides talk about the back, the, kind of the context for where this is coming from. So this is really for the benefit of those that might not be intimately aware. We did a, we did a facilities master plan in 2018 where about 43 recommendations were identified, about $16 million of costs adjusted for inflation that we would wanna to undertake to make sure we have a modern building that can go much deeper into the 21st century without us needing to talk about needing something that's brand new. The examples are there on the slide. The plan also includes obvious needs for expansion. We have been very realistic about, our, about what we can accomplish with and without MSBA. We're trying to position ourselves to be able to do something small and targeted, probably in concert with a renovation of some existing programs. But if we do eventually get invited into the MSBA core program, we will have state subsidies that will allow us to look at a more complete vision. So the strategy for now is to seek a debt authorization to, prior, again, the priority is maintenance, but it's maintenance of our building. But in, we also have to address the reality, which is with some strategic planning, we can make better use of our space. And if we can add just a little bit more, it will be a game changer for our instructional areas. And uh, these are some slides showing uh, where we might be able to expand down the road. I, this is a bird's eye view of our school. Uh, again, I would encourage people viewing this to uh, hit pause here if they want to read the slide more closely. But we've definitely done our homework, and we're not. Th th this is this has gone far beyond the. Hmm, I wonder if we could. We've really done as much as lay people can do to brainstorm where we could impact expanding our building. We tell we tell our communities that we have a 20-year-old modular unit. Again, here's a slide that says that there's the roof we need to replace on the 1992 edition. We target uh, a, a, an inadequate weight room. Uh, we need more space in several of our vocational programs. All of this is outlined in that 2018 report, which is available on our website. And this is what we put in our statement of interest to the MSBA. This is what we need to modernize. Because of, our, because of your continued support, we have the funding available in our stabilization fund, that if MSBA invited us, we would not need to go to our town saying that we need additional funding to fund a feasibility study. So when that day comes, <laughs> whatever the calendar says, we're in a position to be able to fund that. And I'm very happy because it's taken several years for us to get to that point. Okay, I'll transition now to some other numbers to wrap up here. Uh, enrollment trends, and that quick comment about town assessments, which we'll get into more at the January meeting. We had a, we had a net gain of 20 in-district students and a reduction of 14 non-residents. So the, the net gain of 20 in-district students is outlined, is outlined here. And uh, you can see, uh, you can see the one year change in the far, in the far right-hand column. 20, yeah. And uh, this is, again, we, we, we do multi-year projections here, and this is just another visual representation of, of, of our enrollment in, in, in and out of district based on October 1 reports. And we'll speak to this more in January, but I do wanna make sure that we maintain a slide that always can explain to viewers and members of our community how an assessment gets determined. And the messaging that we try to deliver as clearly as we can is that the vast majority of the assessment, or about around 70% of it in recent years, comes from the minimum local contribution, which is set by the state formula, which we will not know about until January 27th, when the governor's projected budget comes out. And that's what Jim uh, uses. He gets the information and uh, you know, within a few hours, he's got a document and that will be the subject of our January 27th meeting. But the rest of our, the, the mechanisms for calculating assessments which we unpack in great detail, uh, involves capital, transportation, other operating costs above the minimum and debt service. 
And those expenses are not based on a state formula. They're based on a regional agreement, which looks at uh, population. And in certain cases, it's a rolling average. And in other cases, it's a fixed average. But more, more time will be spent on that with our, with our friends on finance committees and advisory and also in January. And then a look ahead, again, we meet in late January to allow for some time to get those numbers. Uh, presumably we would set a certification vote as we generally do in February. We'll start our finance committee meetings after the new year. Again, probably on our March or April agenda, there would be a, a debt authorization vote. And as you can see, we've got, uh, we've got some, at least initial dates for spring town meetings and uh, we'll update that. And we know that for economic reasons and other reasons, certainly those dates may change. We know how they changed in calendar year 2020. Uh, but that's, uh, that's generally the arc of our activities going from, from January into the spring. And that is my last slide. So thank you for your patience on uh, many of those slides. You have seen those before. Uh, so Mr. Chairman, that is, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Are there any other questions I might be able to answer before? Yeah, Tom, transition? I have a question. Does Dan? next year's budget incorporate possibly COVID-19 issues still being uh, dealt with? One of the grants we have, Dan, does, uh, does have a longer, uh, a longer shelf life, which is good news. Um, but I would, I would say that my, the comment that I made a little earlier about the added nursing support, yeah. that has been on my mind. Um, but I think, I think by and large, um, the, the, additional, the additional personnel the, the, and, and the resources that we have, I am, I'm, not, I'm not adding substantial dollars uh, for, for COVID expenses. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean on making some, uh, some good decisions at the end of this fiscal year if we need to. Use, use the modest state grant funding that we have. And, um, and there is, I, I would say there's a little bit in terms of personnel, but in general, no, I'm, I'm, expecting, I'm, I'm expecting that we won't have two, like for instance, I'm, I'm expecting that we won't have two bus runs and a staggered start to the school day. Um, okay. I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, that, that's, that's what I'm counting on anyway. Yeah, hopefully, yeah, okay. Exactly. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just briefly for the rest of my report, we have a, uh, a CIT textbook on uh, Windows Server 2019 that I'll be uh, working with CIT to purchase. And uh, my last item is now to turn it over to uh, Mark and Sandy to offer the committee some updates uh, on what's going on around school. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Hickey. Um, Sandy and I are gonna talk a little bit about community tonight. We've been talking about how supportive uh, the community has been for the school since we reopened and how positive the parents have been. Just hitting a couple of highlights um, on the admissions front, following, following up on Mr. Hickey's budget presentation, we have over 200 plus applications at this point. Uh, just to give you some numbers, applications are up in the towns of Abington and Hanover. They're pretty flat in all the other towns except Hanson's. Hanson's a little lower, but everybody else, we're, we're, we're pretty much doing well. As you recall, we usually end up with somewhere around 300 applications uh, because of COVID. Uh, um, Mrs. Dow, our admissions and freshman guidance counselor hasn't been able to go into schools. So we're trying different methods to get students to uh, apply to our school and be interested in what we're going to do. I also wanna thank, um, the community for supporting us. Uh, the Viking Apparel, the, the Parents Association, just uh, tonight they finished up a sale where they made over $2,000 on Viking Apparel, which is fabulous for them. All of their monies will go to scholarships and to support the school. Uh, and, it, and also they did their calendar sale this month uh, with um, items that were, gift cards that were left over from last one of last year's events that was not happening because of COVID. So they made another $5,000 off of that. So they've made about $7,000 in this month only from the community that's supporting us. And I do know that uh, a number of you also supported us in horticulture. They sold out once again on their um, holiday trees and wreaths and things like that. So we thank you for supporting them and the district and the schools and the district supporting the school as it always has. Sandy. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, I have a couple of thank yous. 
I'm going to represent uh, Faith as the student rep and talk a little bit of student activities. And I'm going to end with a little bit of information about some student support. So um, I wanted to thank the school committee and the superintendent and Tom specifically. Well, his last sentence, one of his last sentences in his budget presentation is he's gonna make good decisions at the end of this fiscal year. And really just a thank you to him and all of you and your support of his budget presentations and the, and the process that we now go through um, through the end of the school year to uh, ensure that this is a community that is well supported. Um, you take such good care to make sure that our, our staff is taken care of and that our staff is able to return year after year and that we can support our students in the, in the way that we need to. So thank you very much. And a thank you um, to Mark for the work that he has done since, the, since really the beginning of the school year to make sure that our students' needs are met every day. He greets both sets of buses to make sure that the kids get safely onto our building. He makes sure that all of our kids are fed. He makes sure that every teacher is covered, that they have the resources and the spaces that they need to, um, to get the job done every day. And he, he triages all of those situations um, with our um, assistant Lori every morning. So, so a couple of thank yous that are well-deserved there. Um, from Faith, I wanted to um, give a shout out to uh, the students on the Skills USA organization. They, uh, with their represent, with their um, um, advisors, Lisa Bellantoni and Paul Bello, the holiday, the, they had their annual holiday social last weekend and they were able to distribute um, 30 individualized bags of gifts for individual families. Um, so each child had their own individual bag of gifts, which was distributed across the South Shore directly to the families. Um, they also had a bag of over 30 coats and outerwear uh, for those who need them. And they were able to also um, do a great um, spirit morale builder in our building with a shop by shop challenge. And they had um, are, di are dispersing 2,800 pounds of food to our local food bank. So oh, pretty cool. oh great. Um, yeah, outstanding. Yeah, pretty, really impressive. Um, the kids really came together. It's actually pretty fun to see the crates <laughs> of yes. food being rolled through the hallways. <laughs> Um, and the student council, as we, we form, we like to call them the Stuco um, with Mr. Matt Falano. They're working on a Toys for Top drive, which is going on through the end of this week. And the kids are having a little bit of fun as well. We've got a couple of elves on the shelves hiding about the school and the kids are seeking to find the elves in the shelf, which is kind of fun. In fact, um, Elfie Bear, you can't see him. My, mine is behind me on my tree. He's on the tightrope behind me, uh, hanging out. So the kids, uh, doesn't matter the age, I have teenagers at home. They still like the elf on the shelf. Um, they're doing some spirit days. I know I am in uh, preparation for the ugly sweater day coming up on Friday. Um, and some other fun things coming up. Next. <laughs> the student council um, is also working on developing some pre-recorded messages to share with, uh, so they start to hear more of student voices um, across our announcements uh, on, a, on a regular but not daily basis. So they're working on that. So that's it from Faith. Thank you, Faith. And my last is just to share some uh, information about some uh, supports that we have for our students. So a shout out to our freshmen <coughs> and Amy Dow, our recruitment counselor uh, that Mark mentioned earlier. Uh, we have successfully placed all of our freshmen in shop. We've had shop placement day. The kids will start their first uh, shop day. Um, they're in their first shop cycle this week um, and are getting underway there with their safety training and learning about their, their program of study and their place of choice. So that's exciting. I also wanna talk a little bit about some supports and interventions that we have in place this year for our students who, uh, who need a little extra lift. Um, really being supported by uh, Joe Madera, Todd Zahurik, and Anja Chiarelli, our, our counselors. We have students coming in before the start of their regular school day, but at the start of our teacher's school day. As you know, we have a, a staggered start to our school day. So we have some time in the morning that our students are, are coming in early to get some extra help. That targeted intervention seems to be working. And for those who need it, we have a planned Saturday school in January. I'll let you know with some data how those um, interventions supported students to achieving higher than, than they may ha might, might have without them. And finally, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about remote learning. Because of the strong planning of the leadership team and our ability to be a little bit flexible, and I would say the core work group and remote learning subcommittee staffed by faculty, sort of our sounding board for ideas, those structures have allowed, allowed us to be pretty nimble and we are gonna be able to invite back many of our students who have been remote through that a very expensive edgenuity plan we were talking about earlier. And we're gonna be able to integrate many of them back into our South Shore Tech hybrid courses for semester two. So we will still have students who are remote 
and not coming to school either at all or for academics, that they'll be much more integrated into our, our school program of study and feel that that's the, that's the best for, for our students. So excited about seeing how that works out and want to thank the, the faculty really for their flexibility in, in allowing that to happen as well. So that's it for me. Have a great holiday. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. Thank Bob, you, I have a question for both Mark and Sandy. Go ahead, Robert. Uh, I brought this up with Tom a short while ago, but it was instead reminded me today when I had a, a mother approach me about for an East Bridgewater student entering our school, which I diverted and sent her to Southeastern. Uh, but uh, where we couldn't have our uh, open house this year, I suggested that we put some signs out in some of the bordering communities that we are open for enrollments and so forth. Uh, and now's the time to contact us and enroll in for the, the future classes. Uh, so I just want, want your thoughts on that. No, I think that's a good idea. We can make use of our parents, as we often do, and have them put them on their front lawn. So I will work with um, one of our providers to make some lawn signs, and we can get them out in a relatively short time period. That'll work, Mr. Mola. Yeah, at, uh, I have a, a new and innovative idea, but I want to pass it by uh, our superintendent before I even bring it. It may help us get a large scale project going for additional students. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, team, I'll free up my calendar. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. With bated breath. <laughs> yeah. We just need to make sure the lawn signs are not white. Yes. <laughs> Some oh, <big> yeah. color. <laughs> uh, Viking green works well. There, there we go, there we go. There you go. Oh, my God, my see it all together. Okay. <laughs> thank, uh, yes. thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that I think that wraps up uh, my segment of the report. And and I might suggest that um, unless there are other comments on debt authorization under unfinished business, uh, yeah. I may have covered that sufficiently already. That's yeah. what I thought. I was I thought you would cover that. Um, okay, for new business, we have a donation. I will need a. Uh, I ask for a motion to approve the donation of a truck, a 2019 GMC, Sierra Chevy Silverado. Motion. Second by Whitman. Second by Whitman. Yeah. Any discussion on the motion? None. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. The motion carries. Thank you. Warrants is Jim still with or Bob? Yeah, uh, Bob's Bob can't help you tonight. That's that's all me. So, that. yeah, um, the warrants this month are uh, 10, 10 B, 11, 11 A, and 11 B, totaling one million one hundred forty nine dollars, one hundred forty nine thousand two hundred twelve dollars and nine cents. One one four nine two one two zero nine. I'll second that. Okay. We'll probably need a motion made by someone. Someone needs to move. I'll make a motion to accept the numbers. Okay, we got okay. Rockland first. Okay. Rockland and uh, I'll second Whitman. Whitman. Any discussion on the motions? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carries. Any requests for action, gentlemen? I have one thing, Bob, just to um, just to update. I mean, just to, I was going to follow up on Tom's conversation about the budget, but just to give um, the committee a, an update. Um, right now, our stabilization fund has about one point seven million dollars in it. I think Tom had talked about the we had sufficient money in there for design and, and so forth. If invited into it, um, S, you know, M MSBA, whatever. But it's uh, it is has grown. The committee has added money to that, so we have about one point seven million in there. Um, there's about um, 70,000 that has been set aside to, to help defray the cost of the bus leases, but literally there's, there's 1.624 million um, for other projects that um, and 
if the roof gets done, we have to drag some money out of stabilization. So that money's there at the whim of the uh, school committee. I think you need a two thirds vote to get the money out of the stabilization. But but again, the balance is, is pretty um, pretty comfortable right now based upon uh, where we are. So. No, I go I go along with that, Jim. Uh, as long as it doesn't go into operational parts of the school, like salaries and uh, stuff like that, as long as it's used for, you know, one time expenses. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually, when every every year that you vote to put money into the stabilization fund, um, it is it is for design, build, construction, and improvements. So you can't use it for anything other than what you voted for. So we did vote a specific amount a couple of years ago to help defray the bus costs, bus lease. So that can only be used for the bus lease. So again, it's sort of like a town meeting warrant that they vote a town meeting warrant and they specifically can't use that money for other items um, unless uh, the board decides to, you know, put the money into the back into the general fund at some point down the road. But again, again, we have a, we have a substantial um, comfortable margin right now. And again, we've added more money um, we add more money in as part of the budget every year. So, well, that was my uh, reason for saying it uh, because the uh, school committee could change their mind, and I would uh, fight to uh, not let them change their mind and leave it as is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any anybody else have anything request for action? Uh, not request for action. I just have a question for uh, Dr. Hickey, if he can, for tomorrow. Uh, Tom, they're calling for major possible power outages, and if we're doing remote, how is that going to open up a can of worms with some kids lose power, some kids don't, or? There, there, is, there is definitely the potential for that, uh, Bob. What we've done to kind of build in a plan B um, is that by, by making the decision a little earlier, we were able to spend um, today making sure that, uh, number one, teachers had pro teachers provided work and students learned how to download and access that work. So if it's, um, if it's 10 o'clock in the morning and it's light out and a kid didn't have power, if as long as their device, let's say their Chromebook was charged, they could potentially still do work on their device. Yeah. So it's, this is going to be an interesting conversation statewide as we go through this unique winter where what's a snow day and what's a remote day. So it is entirely <laughs> possible to have a remote day and have it also be uh, asynchronous where you're not actually with the teacher. We've done such a good job and set such a high bar for all of our learning is live, whether the kid, obviously if they're in school, but when the kids are remote, they are with a teacher in the Brady Bunch squares on the on the Google Meet, <laughs> and uh, that's phenomenal. So, but you are right. There's the chance that there would be some sporadic power outages. Uh, when I reached out to families earlier in the month, um, and I think we have to go a little deeper into the winter. But I would totally support that if I want to see how this first remote day goes. Um, oftentimes we won't know when there are power outages, but if we were, if, if, you know, if 24 hours ago they were saying significant power outages are likely, um, that's definitely a way to influence what to do. But where I am now is if the kids can, if the kids can get some value out of a day where they're, where they're learning asynchronous in an asynchronous format, I'd like to start by trying that. Teachers have spent some time, um, but I would agree that the next storm that comes down the pike if, if it looks like there's going to be widespread power outages, or if we learn a lot from this first experience, then calling a regular snow day and adding it in June may be the right answer. And um, so that, that's, I, that definitely is still an option. So if some kids do lose power, at the very least, they've all been given work from their teachers that they would be able to engage with. I agree with you, Tom. Uh, Sounds good. Sounds good. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Fingers crossed. Just asking That's the question. Old. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. All right. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, I'll make that motion. Dan Salvucci from Whitman, with all due respect. Uh, Second by Tom from Abington. Thank you, Tom. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And it's definitely that motion carries. Yeah. <laughs>